to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I am Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. So, Reed, in today's episode, we are going to bring the audience the 65 Foxtrot 65F Finance Officer Career Field. And I've been quoted in this in our podcast many times before saying that if there are two people that you need to be best friends with, one of them is the finance officer there at your base. And so I really hope that our audience is going to listen to this episode so they can hear why I say that's one of the most important people that they need to know. Yeah, and I think Lieutenant Colonel King does a really good job of highlighting that. And I learned a lot through this interview, and I'm looking forward to bringing it to our audience today. Yeah, everybody who's listening to this, get out your notebook because you're about to hear just knowledge bomb after knowledge bomb that is going to be so helpful to you, whether you're going to be a finance officer or whether you're just going to be working someplace in the Air Force where they spend money, which is everywhere. everywhere. Yep, that's it. Yeah, everywhere. Awesome. Looking cool. forward to it. Yep. So let's turn it over there to Lieutenant Colonel Nathan King. Lieutenant Colonel Nathan King, welcome to the podcast. We are super excited to have you to talk about a career field that I'm familiar with, but honestly, I have so many misconceptions about, and I imagine that so many other people do as well. So let's talk about finance. But before we do that, let's give you the opportunity to introduce yourself a little bit. How did you get into the Air Force? Why did you join? What was your experience? Those things that led you to where you are today. Well, yeah, thanks for having me on, Colin. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk about my experience. Hopefully, I have something that can help somebody who is interested in the finance career field, National Guard, or any other part of my career that can help somebody in their career. Yeah. So I come from a military family. My father was in the Army for 20 years. So we grew up traveling all over the world. I lived in Panama during the Operation Just Cause to get Noriega pulled out. Oh. So I lived through that invasion. I lived in Belgium for three years of high school, while my dad was at Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe, which they call SHAPE, where he was working on the Bosnia situation there in the 90s. So a lot of traveling. My dad taught at West Point at one point. A lot of good experiences with the military. So my experiences were almost all positive. I loved traveling. I loved the military lifestyle. So I had always thought about the possibility of the military. I hadn't made that decision until I was at ASU walking around and seeing the Air Force cadets. And something just okay. Something just lit up for me. I'm like, I need to go talk to those guys. Because I had thought about West Point and going to an academy before, but it was the Army side. I hadn't had that much experience with the Air Force, but I went to that ROTC detachment and took the AFOQT and got into the two-year program. Because at that point, I was okay. I was kind of old for ROTC. I was married. I was 23 years old. So it was a different experience, <laughs> way different experience. Looking for me. back, 23 doesn't sound very old now no, anymore. It but when you're going with 18, 19-year-old kids, it was different experience than most people who go through ROTC uh, because I – yeah. I didn't get involved as much socially with the cadets, and it was such a brief time. Just a different place in life, yeah. Different place in life, but it was at that 025 at ASU where I did the two-year program, spent six weeks of field training. You know, now mm. 13 days of field training now, <laughs> I did six weeks, and that was a expanded field training at Lackland Air Force Base for those cadets who are in the condensed program. So it involved yeah. some additional academic work. So that was tough, but I enjoyed it. I didn't think it was as tough physically as it should have been, but 
they really pushed you in different ways in the physical part. So yeah. So I commissioned from ASU in 2005, February of 2005. And well, let me back up a bit. First okay. of all, I was an accounting major. So my dad had an MBA and I'm trying to figure out with him what I wanted to get a degree in. And he said, if you get that accounting base, then all those other things are easier to get, finance sure. and marketing and all that. But that accounting base is something you can expand off. So I never really wanted to be a lifetime accountant, but I knew that that accounting degree would open up some opportunities. So I was already had my eye on that prize before I got into ROTC. Okay. So once I got into ROTC, it just made sense for me to include finance on my dream sheet for my AFSCs. I also had on their cost analysis, a 65W, because I had heard about going to one of those big SPOs, uh, Wright-Patterson, or working on you know big weapon systems. Yep. But I got 65F. I was happy with that. Now, there are cadets who aren't happy when they get 65F. Right. Right. And, and other cadets tease them and give them a hard time. Oh, you're going to finance. I was happy to get it. The good thing about 65F, for people who are interested in finance, base level finance is at every base. Right. So your opportunities of assignments are very vast. There are some career fields, you get a pick of two or three bases, right? And that's it. So that's the good thing about finance is you've got this wide variety of bases you can go to, Right. cool experiences, different types of bases you can Go from a refueling wing to a rescue wing to a mobility wing. I've done all three in finance. So that's a cool opportunity. So I got that AFSC. And then on my locations, I put all these West Coast cities spaces because my significant other wanted to be close to Arizona. So I had right. Arizona, Luke, I had Davis Monthan, I had Los Angeles, I had... Hawaii, just for fun, and international base as well, and Yokota, Japan. They sent me to McConnell Air Force Base, Kansas. So, <laughs> so that was not expected. I was not expecting to go to Wichita, Kansas. But one thing I could tell people that are interested in the military, and something I learned growing up, is an assignment is what you make of it. Yeah. And growing up, I would get to a base, and there'd always be those other kids oh, this place is the worst. I hate this place. And I would love it, you know? So I think my parents did a really good job of expanding. Wherever we were, we'd go out and explore. Yeah. We'd go to different areas. I loved exploring in the woods or wherever we were, the Panama jungles. My parents, at, for some reason, my parents at age 11 bought me a machete. <laughs> so I was out there whacking around in the jungles of Panama so I loved that military life. I loved making the best of the situation. So I really did enjoy McConnell Air Force Base. The people in Wichita are like the friendliest people. It was a shock, like walking around and just like going to every store and just how friendly everybody was. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. So. And did your wife enjoy it too, knowing that she wanted to stay somewhere close to Arizona? She actually did enjoy it. And we had a nice little community, nice house, a good affordable home for a second lieutenant. So I know the the one thing is that fear of when you first commission of, especially when you come from an academy or ROTC where you're kind of conditioned to be like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. And I remember my supervisor calling me. Uh, he was a captain, Captain Collins. And he's like, hey, what's up, man? And I'm like, <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I'm like, I'm like, scared I'm going to make a mistake. And uh, I'm like worried when I show up there, do I need to report in? And, and it was just so much more laid back, but professional. Yeah. Like kind of that mix of like still professional, but you know, they treat you like a human being. And I got there and like right away felt super comfortable with everybody in the unit and the squadron. And the thing about finance is Finance does get a bad rap from a lot of people because finance has to follow the AFIs and the DOD, right. FMR, and all these regs that aren't always the easiest to work with, or some of the rules do hinder our flexibility 
in serving the customer. And so, you know, people take it out on finance, but the people I worked with in finance were some of the best people in right. the Air Force and supported the mission just the same as everybody else did. McConnell, our chant was no cash, no gas. Because, you know, <laughs> without finance, the mission doesn't run. No right. gas, people can't fly, no personnel. So I really was happy to have McConnell Air Force Base as my first assignment. I had a, a commander come in who was excellent at giving me a good variety of jobs. So the thing about finance at the base level for an officer, it's divided when you first get in in two different segments. You have the customer support section, which has, you know, you got customer service desk, they work on travel pay, they work on people with military pay issues. And then you have the budget accounting side, and they deal with all the money that comes from the Air Force, make sure it's spent in the right place, make sure resource advisors are trained. So I got to dip my toes in both of those areas in my first three years. Oh, that's great. Which was awesome. I always recommend people to, when they're young, volunteer for a variety of things if they can. Yeah. So I was the deputy dispersing officer. I was a services deputy. I was the resource advisor for the director of staff, which worked with, you know, the chaplain and JAG, MEO. So I worked with smaller pots of money, but that was like a good practice on the overall budget for the wing. Right. So during that job, I heard about the National Guard. The funny thing is, when you talk to people in active duty, and I'm sure you get it with the reserves, they know very little about how the Guard and the Reserve operate. Sure. And I mean, I'll admit, I know very little about the reserves and the little tricks and things that you guys do in the reserves. So the guard was something that I found out from a commander who was backfilling for my first commander who was deployed. And I was like, man, I could stay my whole career with one unit and be full time. And so I started looking at jobs all over throughout the U.S. Now, the thing to remember during this time was it was a reduction in force. Right. It was a riff. So Yeah, this was the 2000... This 2004, 2005. Yeah. I think they finished it up in the 2005, maybe 2006. But they were having people volunteer at each AFSC. And if they didn't get enough volunteers, they were just cutting people. Yeah. And it was pretty brutal. I know a lot of people who had been in, you know, six, seven, eight years and just gone. Yep. And good troops, too. So I was thinking... If I'm going to be on a potential list, I'd rather be the master of my own destiny. Right. I'd rather find something to do. And one trick that someone taught me, you know, he told me, no one is ever going to care as much about your career as you are. So you have to start doing the things that are going to help you advance your career. Yeah. And so I opened up a spreadsheet. And I started just marking down any achievements that I had, even if it was a small thing as a, a second lieutenant, you know, and started documenting that. So by the time I got to apply for these different positions all over the guard, I had some things to draw from, right? And I interviewed with, I'd say about three different units, great experience. I mean, I always say interview as much as you can to get yep. practice Yep. because, you know, I was probably pretty bad at first. Well, and that's something that we as officers don't get to practice very often because we don't interview for jobs on a regular basis. You know, we True. just get assigned where we're going to go next. So if you do look at Palace Chase, do as many interviews as you can. Now, the good thing about the Guard, if anyone's interested in going to the Guard, if you are somebody who doesn't care where you live, your opportunities are great. There's openings all over the United States. Right. The trick is get into where you want to go, there's limited spots at each wing, especially for officers. Right. So it's about getting your foot in the door with the guard wing and then proving your worth and value there right. to where you can get to where you want to go. So my route was I'm going to apply everywhere. And I applied in Michigan, Connecticut. I applied in Washington. And I finally found a situation that fit me well in Rhode Island. Okay. With a 143rd airlift wing. It's in North Kingstown. And it worked out because I was a first lieutenant, but my comptroller was also a first lieutenant. And so 
he couldn't hire anyone above a first lieutenant. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't have to compete against captains. And so he was nice enough to wait for me for my palace chase stuff to work out. And anyone who's in the military knows when you submit packages, the approval process is always, whatever they tell you it's going to be, add like two or three months on top of that. Sure. <laughs> right. So we waited a few months and got the approval. And I was out to Rhode Island as an art technician there. And I was the budget officer. So I was in charge of all the money that came down to that specific wing. And it's a really cool job. The cool thing about a budget officer is like when you're a pilot, you've got that sheet and you've got to check everything on there and you got to do everything. Yep. It's cool. But like when you're a budget officer, they're like, here's $26 million. They're coded in these pots of money, but how you run that program, that's up to you and your wing commander. Yeah. So, you know, you meet often with the leadership of the wing. So you get a good feel of all the different units and their needs and what resources they have. You get to talk to the wing commander and the vice wing and advise them on how to use the money. So money that comes down in the Air Force comes in different colors. That's allocated for certain things. Right. But there's flexibility in some of those pots of money. So each wing gets what's called base operating costs. And it's not a whole lot for the Guardian. I think it was usually around $1.5 million. But that's something that they say, here you go. You guys figure out how you want to spend that among your units. Right. And so that's a cool thing. You get to train these resource advisors and commanders to say, build me your spend plans, teach them how to fight for their resources, how to submit the purchase contracts, purchase requests in properly. And... You get to have some influence on how that money is spent based on how you analyze it, the recommendations you give to the commander. Yeah. It's a cool thing. So I did that for three years in Rhode Island. I love Rhode Island. I love the New England area, but it was cold. Yeah. It was real cold. <laughs> and the winters were tough. So I started looking at other places and I looked at California and the Bay Area. A little bit different than Rhode Island. Yeah, way different. The 129th Rescue Wing in California. So again, to be a budget officer, but that was for an active guard reserve, AGR. Okay. So for those who aren't familiar with an AGR, that's like the golden goose of, yeah. of the military. <laughs> you get to be active duty, get all the same benefits of active duty, and you get to stay at the same base for your whole career if you want to. So for many people. So you can do a full 20 years as an AGR at one base right, and get active duty retirement. So I was lucky enough to get that position. And the plan ultimately was to become the comptroller. So okay. career progression for a finance officer at base level is that you will work in probably a customer service role as a commander there on the customer service side. And then ultimately you'll go over to the other side to budget. Yeah. So you'll need experience with both of those. And then you have the opportunity when you become field grade officer, or if you're in the guards, sometimes it's a company grade. Yeah, I was going to say, unless you're a first lieutenant in Rhode Island. Yeah, and he was <laughs> prior enlisted. So that was the difference there. There's okay. a lot more prior enlisted officers in the guard. So when you become a major, that's when you start looking at those comptroller positions so my first commander was a major, he pinned on a lieutenant colonel, and now a full colonel. So there's opportunities at the base level. Typically, those comptroller positions on base level are major to lieutenant colonel. Typically, you're not going to get full colonel by staying base level comptroller. Usually, you're going to have to do some assignment, a joint assignment, go to the Pentagon, work at the functional level to get that further rank, or you could move to a different position like a director of staff or a mission support group commander. So that's kind of the avenue where I'm at right now. Okay. So I, after five years as a budget officer in California, I went through a divorce. So I was looking at going back to Arizona because that's where my family was. That's where my ex-wife's family was. And it just so happened that there was that VL pad position yeah. for ROTC. Now, People who are in active duty, whenever you commission, there's always opportunities outside of your current path. 
Right. So you, if you get picked for a comp light or CE, there's always avenues to move out of that, to move to the guard or reserve. It's just about taking care of what you need to take care of so that you're qualified and eligible to do that thing. Right. So doing your PME, doing all of your schooling. I got my master's degree right away when I got in, did my PME right away, I did my SOS as fast as I could. And by checking all the boxes and getting everything ready, I was ready for those opportunities to move to get that initial guard position, to get the AGR position, and then ultimately to get this ROTC position. So just so happened that ASU was one of the schools. It was perfect. It was my old debt. It was right by my hometown. Yeah. Got that position and spent three awesome years there. And I would totally encourage anybody who is interested in mentoring and broadening to take that opportunity. I know you enjoyed it. Absolutely. Yep. We had a great time at field training. <laughs> twice. <laughs> yeah, it was it was awesome. You did it twice. I only did it once, but it was a great opportunity. I would have done it longer if I could have. Yeah, absolutely. But still has that stigma of this kind of will get in the way of your career. It didn't for me. And it didn't for a lot of people I know. So the challenge for me as a guard member is that they said, you have to totally separate from the guard and you have to find a position to be gained back when you get out. Right. So it's like that last year scrambling, okay, where can I find a unit? And this is where building relationships is so important. Right. When I was a first lieutenant, I went to a budget officer school. There was another lieutenant who was also learning how to be a budget officer. And he was going to be a budget officer with the 161st Air Refueling Wing in Phoenix, Arizona. We got along well. I kept in touch with him for years, trading emails, messages. And when I got to ASU, you know, having lunch with him a few times, well, when it got to be time for, hey, I'm looking for a position, I had a contact who was a comptroller, had the ear of his commanders there. Yeah. I was able to go down there. He introduced me to people. I let him know my experience and lucky enough to have a couple positions open up. So I interviewed for director of staff and for inspector general. Okay. And received the inspector general position. Okay. So you're an IG now? I am an IG. And here's another plug is that as you learn your job and you get proficient at your job, there's opportunities to expand that knowledge by volunteering to help the IG. Okay. Now there's the wing inspection team where you can volunteer to be on the team to do the inspections for the wing. And then there's the MAGCOM inspectors. So while I was in Rhode Island and California, I went with AMC and AETC and did several inspections all over the place yeah. as a representative for FM. And that experience and knowledge was key to me getting the IG job because I was able to tell them exactly my philosophy, what the IG program was about, my experience. And it was it was a pretty easy transition to the IG shop. Cool. Especially with finance background. Yeah. So let me tell you, I've heard numerous people say, two things to know in the Air Force, if you know these two things, you'll have a lot of power, is money and people. Yeah. All right. So the money portion of learning how you acquire things, how you manage those resources, and then how to get the right people into all those positions is going to win you a lot of friends because that's commander's biggest issues. Right. And yet enough people, how do I fill these positions? How do I get this equipment for my people? If you know how to do that, you'll be valuable. And that's the great thing I tell people assigned to FM to be finance officers is you learn how to manage money, you're going to be very valuable in the future. Absolutely. Not just in the military, but that's a valuable skill in anything that they might be involved in in the future. For sure. And there are people who get out after a few years, especially those who work more on the acquisition side, because that is something that's highly sought out right now. But it's been super valuable to me just personally and professionally. So even though now I'm not in the finance career field, I'm still involved with the finance career field in a way, because we, the IG, were very concerned with 
managing resources. Yep. That's, uh, that's one of our major graded areas. So I still work with finance on audits and inspections and always help people with their DTS because <laughs> I'm a DTS guru. I, I, I implemented DTS at two different bases. So I'm actually one of the few people who like DTS. It has improved immensely over the years. Yeah. You know, five years ago, it was still a hot mess, but more recently, it's been vastly improved, is far more functional and user-friendly. It is. The problem I have with it is the requirements that the Air Force makes us do yeah. in order to get a voucher or authorization approved. Like, you need to put in this jargon in the thing that's saying it's not going to be a video conference. And yeah. they just have these silly things that they say have to be done when it's like, just put in where you're going, how you're going to get there, and what yeah. you want reimbursed. and and push it through. So yep. if I were in charge, I'd make things better. I had lots of ideas to improve the <laughs> regs, but they never asked me. But it's still, considering the vast size of this organization and the restrictions that we have with the law and also on our ability to create new software platforms, I mean, it's not bad. But it definitely could stand to be improved. 100%. And that's been one of General Brown's things lately with Accelerate, Change, or Lose is we can do this better. Yeah. We do this to ourselves. You know, these issues that we're talking about are not imposed on us from some external source aside from the law itself, which comes from Congress, right? But like you're just saying, putting the specific jargon into DTS in order to get it approved, we do that to ourselves. Right. Yeah, most of the, the things we do, we do to ourselves. Why are we creating six different systems from six different contractors that don't talk to each other that need six different logins? Yeah. <laughs> like uh, that was a difficult part of finance is the uh, systems and, you know, the network not responding and being stuck at your computer without the systems working the way they should. So there's a lot of frustrations on the internal part of finance. And then you have the frustrations of dealing with customers who are sometimes fairly, but most often unfairly angry at you. Yep. And so, you know, I always say, be nice to finance. Uh, <laughs> even if you're mad, you catch more flies with honey. You know, right. I, I tell you the officers who come in, and this is more typically young officers, like young captain pilots, come in and start being snotty and mean to our, our customer service guys. They're not going to get the benefit of the doubt. Right. You know, so... The people who made friends with finance, you're going to get the best customer service. And that's just a natural sequence of life. You know, like yep. people, when they like you, they're willing to do more things for you. So I had people call me all the time and it didn't bother me like, hey, can you push my DTS through? Or I've got a question with this. And I right. was more than happy to answer because they treated me with respect. And then when I needed something, I go to them. Yep. And that's kind of that professional courtesy that most officers get that. Most of them do. Yeah, there are those bad apples that don't get that and think, you know, because they wear bars or because they wear a slightly different uniform from the rest of us, a slightly different badge that is shaped in a different way. I'm not naming any particular career fields or anything, but <laughs> <laughs> they think that they own the place for whatever reason and extend that authority that they think they have to areas and offices completely outside of where they've been assigned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, for sure. Well, we have covered a lot of ground up to this point, but I want to go back and cover something that, I mean, you hit up on a lot of the things that are really important to the finance career field, you know, the places that you can go with a career developmental path, that sort of thing. But I want to go even more foundational and even further back than that, which is, first of all, why have an officer be in charge of finance at all? Why is that the case? Why not have an enlisted member do it or why not have a civilian do it who's outside of the military construct? So answer that question for me because I honestly don't know the answer. Why have an officer be the budget officer or the person in charge of customer service? Why have a 65F at all? Sure. There is that military construct when you have several young enlisted people working for you to have that officer, that's an important part of that military construct in order to provide 
mentoring, provide discipline when needed, be able to speak to that person in military terms, get them to the trainings that they need, make sure they scramble around to get the breadth and depth that they need because they understand the military career field, yeah. writing those EPRs. There's that element of having an officer on that side. Now, the budget side, there's a lot of active duty bases that have more civilians in their budget side than they do military. Okay. It's not that case in the National Guard. I know the reserves, typically comptrollers, or I've seen a lot of comptrollers be civilians. Okay. So a comptroller can be civilian. You can have civilians fill these officer roles. Okay. Right. I think they do it in the reserves just for a continuity, which I think is a pretty valuable thing. Yeah. But at the same time, when you learn in your auditing classes, you have somebody who has a ton of familiarity and they're there all the time and they know it better than everyone else. That's going to increase your risk of fraud. So I don't think it's too complicated to have it move around. And I think that's another part of having military members in there is just that dynamic of the military and following the regs and following these policies has that military flavor to it, yeah. which uh, some civilians may not be as careful with. Okay. So if I'm understanding you correctly, it sounds like it's not so much that the authority or the commission of an officer is what's really driving the purpose of having an officer be the 65F budget officer, but more just that they speak military and they have a different perspective and a different respect for what we do in the military that maybe a civilian who never served might have or might not have. Yeah. And anything above that, I can't really give the answer on why they do the things they do. But I've seen prior enlisted and, and retired military members who've served civilian in finance, and they do a wonderful job and they get it. So I know that's a big thing from the Air Force is finding out why do we need a blue suit to do this job? Yeah. And defending that, that's not my job. That's out of my purview. I just feel that <laughs> Like when they did transition finance and they moved that finance center to South Dakota and they hired a bunch of civilians in there and they expanded DFAS, to me, quality went down. Okay. And it wasn't because I think civilians weren't capable. I just think it's that military construct that is necessary at the smaller level of a command level where you have that control where military were held to a higher standard than civilians. So if we mess up, it's going to be more dire consequences. Yeah. Right. To fire a civilian is very, very difficult. Right. And so the incentive for military to do a good job because it's going to affect their promotion, that their disciplinary could be more difficult. Like those are things that all could lead to a sharper and more efficient service. Yeah. The incentives for the officer are very different for sure. The things that we are subject to and the possible range of punishments because of the UCMJ, I wholeheartedly agree with you. That changes the way that we think about these things. I mean, in all my interactions with senior level officers, the question that always seems to be on their mind is if I spend this money in this way, am I going to jail? <laughs> like mm -hmm. That is the question and that is what's at stake here when they are talking about the execution of government dollars within the military is that there is that possibility that if they screwed it up, they could lose their rank, they could lose position, they could lose their commission altogether, mm -hmm. they could end up in jail. All of these punishments obviously are nothing that any one of us want and is not something, maybe civilians will end up going to jail for something like fraud or you know fraud, waste and abuse or something like that, but it's not going to be to the level that an officer might experience. Yeah, I can't tell you the number of times wing commanders have told me like, just keep me out of jail. <laughs> that's yep. they know that that's our role. Yeah. And so on that note, that's actually where I wanted to go next is you mentioned earlier when you were talking about being a budget officer, that relationship with the wing commander, that it's the two of you having these conversations about how to set up the budget, how to execute it, you know, the flexibility that's there. And 
I wonder if you could take a moment to talk about what is that relationship like working with a wing commander who's most often going to be an 06 or an 07? What, what sort of experience have you had with that? What have you learned from it? And how has it helped you to grow as an officer up to this point? Man, that's a great question. And I could tell you, it helps you know what you want to do in the future as a leader and what you don't want to do, right? <laughs> so the thing is that we take for granted a lot of times as officers is how the whole wing views what's going on. Right. Especially in my position where I'm working directly with wing leadership, both as comptroller, flight, and IG. I work directly for the wing commander. I hear his vision all the time. I see what he's trying to do. To me, it makes sense. Right. But take for granted that doesn't always make sense to the people below you. And so I've gotten to see how different commanders are able to communicate that message, how they're able to effectively use their resources. And I've been very impressed with most of them. Yeah. And it's not an easy job. And that's the thing you learn is, you know, people always have their complaints about leadership. Enlisted always have, you know, this officer, that, this officer. And, you know, some of it's very valid. Right. But at the same time, it's hard until you're seeing that position and how difficult it is to convey and pass that down. Because, you know, I've sat in meetings where the wing commander is speaking to the group commanders and he's repeating the same thing that he's been saying for a long time. Yeah. And then hear from squadron commanders or people below that who are like, why isn't he telling us this? Or this doesn't make sense because that message doesn't filter down. Well, the wing commander can't go to every single person and tell him. So what I've learned is repetitiveness is very effective. Yeah. My wing commander now is so good at that, of just being on message, making sure he's consistent, making sure he's going down to the different levels. He'll go to each unit and give a certain message if it's going to be his theme and something he wants to drive. So that's a big thing I've learned is how to communicate your message as a leader and how to get the most out of your people. Yeah. I wonder if you could take a minute too to talk about some of like the process of prioritizing competing requirements, you know, because within a given wing, you're going to have the operations going up against support and you need both things in order to carry out the mission. But how do you decide or how do you advise the wing commander to decide which priority to select and execute on? Uh, another good question. And uh, that could be a frustrating thing because ultimately it's the wing commander's decision. Yeah. I can advise as much as I want, but he is the one who makes the call. And so what I try to do is provide him with as much support to make that decision. And I could advise based on my support. Now I've been pretty fortunate that most of the time when I recommend things, the commander goes for that thing most of the time because it's usually very common sense. You show them the numbers, you, you show them the justification, and you pass on what your RAs have told you. Other times you put together data. So when I got to the 129th Rescue Wing, I found that Ops Group had a ton of money left over at the end of the year, and they would just buy tons of equipment and things they wanted. Right. Meanwhile, like logistics was always begging for travel money. So what I did is I did a analysis on the different EEC codes, which say like travel or supply or GPC. Yeah. And I took the number of personnel that they had and I did different analysis on each EEC. So for travel, I said, all right, how many people do they have? How many are full-time? How many are part-time? So that those are different pots of money for your AGR versus your technician and DSG. And I divided on how much money per person they were spending on travel. And ops group was spending like four times as much for each person <laughs> on travel than LRS was. Yeah. And they had money left over to buy stuff. So I redistributed the money to LRS, cut the money from ops group after I you know, talked to the commander and got the approval. And ops group was never short, even after those cuts, right? So those are the type of things that as a budget officer, they're asking you to do is, is not just do what's always been done and, you know, just pass out the money when it comes 
just like it's always been done. Every year, every quarter, you should be looking at where that money is being spent and how you could spend it more effectively. Yeah. And a lot of that's keeping your ear on all the units. So each unit has a resource advisor. Now, on active duty, some of those resource advisors are full-time civilians, but most resource advisors, that's an additional duty for them. Yeah. So that's kind of a thankless job sometimes too. So communicating with resource advisors, getting out there, talking to them, training them, that's something I've always tried to do is not just sit at my desk, but to get up, go talk to resource advisors. I was a government travel card monitor. Mm -hmm. So I went and talked to my agency program coordinators, made sure I knew what was going on with them on that side of it. And as IG, I go and meet with all the squadron commanders and I make sure those messages are being passed down, that I get information on their self-assessment programs. Because as nice as email is, as nice as phone calls are, face-to-face -face just has just something a little extra. Oh, yeah. And that something little extra is the nonverbals that come with mm -hmm. the communication and being able to, I mean, we talk about the importance of a relationship, right? That's basically a major thing that's coming out of our conversation here. And it's very difficult to have a relationship with somebody through email or through a phone call. Mm -hmm. Not impossible, right? But if you really want to get to know somebody, you're going to want to get there in the room with them so you can have that conversation whether easy or tough, so you can read those nonverbals and really pick up on what they're trying to say back to you. Yeah. And there always comes up things that have nothing to do with work, which helps foster those connections in the uh -huh. relationship. You know, when you're emailing, it's typically you stick to the work or the call, what I need at this moment. You go to their office, you see a picture, you start talking about that area, you get, you know, their kids or some other connection. Yeah. So I've always found that getting out from your desk is not just a nice thing to do. It's something you have to do. One thing that someone told me as a young lieutenant is go to every single person in your office, ask them what they do when you first get to a base. Yeah. Ask what they do. And not only does that give you some experience on what is going on in this office, but also people will know that you're interested in what they do. And that's a start of a relationship where like, hey, this officer actually cares. He's not just yeah. cares about what's stock in the snack bar. He actually <laughs> wants to learn this stuff. And the thing you don't realize when you, you become an officer, you go to this base, a lot of these enlisted folks think that you know what you're doing. <laughs> like, <laughs> like they think you've gone to tech school. Like when you're enlisted, you go to basic, you go to tech school, you come to your base, you're ready to go. Right. You know, I went straight from ROTC to my base, no tech school. And I just remember an enlisted guy like, what? <laughs> you never have gone to tech school? I'm like, no, I'm just here knowing nothing, trying to learn what I can. With all the authority of a commission, yeah. ready to make decisions. <laughs> that does kind of play into all the stereotypes of a lieutenant. But, you know, I tried to be as involved as I could, which is a frustrating part about being a lieutenant is you're very limited on your knowledge. Right. You're very limited on your ability to affect change, but that's just the time to soak everything up. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So there's a couple other things that kind of come out of the conversation here about establishing those relationships, having connections so that you can build that trust and that network and that ability to socialize through problems and drive at a solution. Something else that people have heard me say on this podcast before that I personally recommend that you be best friends with two officers on the base. One is the contracting officer and the other one is the finance officer because they're the two people that control the money, right? Mm -hmm. And if you can be friends with those who control the money, that's how you're really going to accomplish things. But exactly what you've been saying, if you approach those people with humility and willingness to learn, not just as somebody who is a finance officer wanting to learn what everybody else is doing, but maybe you're a CE officer like me who needs to get a project funded, well, approach the, the finance officer with that humility, with that willingness to learn and gain that insight onto what is the budget like? What are those constraints? What are the priorities that the, the wing commander and the budget officer are trying to work through? And with that knowledge and understanding of what they're dealing with, you can bring that back to your own unit, make more sound decisions with what you're doing with your resources 
as well as help communicate that message and that vision on behalf of the wing commander to the people that are around you. So this goes every which direction. It's not just the finance officer who needs to have that perspective as well. And I would add the force support commander in there too. Yeah. Because that's, you know, you're looking at not just filling vacancies and positions, but promotions and training, you know, your base training manager, like all those things are huge resources. So I totally agree with you on that. So this conversation has cleared up a couple of misconceptions for me, but I want to give you the opportunity to address just the idea of misconceptions about finance in general, because I do feel like it is one of the more misunderstood, underappreciated career fields and areas within the Air Force. So like, for example, a misconception to get you started, is the finance system still working off of MS-DOS within... <laughs> within your computer system? Like, do you have to like use MS-DOS within Windows 10 in order to process financial records? Is that still a thing? Is that true? No, no longer. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't that long ago. So yeah, there was a system we had to get into that was the black screen with the green lettering with very <laughs> archaic type instructions and not like this guide of here's how to do it. Like it was passed on from people of like this type in and it's just the stuff that makes no sense. And that Hit was the F4 called, key. <laughs> yeah, that was called DGMS and that was a pay system and an accounting system that has been replaced. So that's no longer a thing. Okay. But that was not something I used a whole lot other than to load budget targets. They had a system called Chris that was used for analyzing, which was a pretty nice system. You could create pivot tables and okay. all these different ways to drill down to the data. So we're not using the big box computers with DOS anymore. And you know, it's, <laughs> But the point is that you were at one point. <laughs> you know what? I may be wrong. They still might be using it. <laughs> I've been out of the career field for four years, and I know the plan was to get rid of it. So... <laughs> Maybe someone's listening to this being like, oh, we still have to use that crap. I'm sure they'll let us know. Yeah. <laughs> But maybe by bringing it to public light, you know, that will yeah. light a fire under somebody to maybe. finally move us into now 2021. Yeah, that would be nice. I've got another misconception maybe that you can clear up for me. How true is it, this idea, you have to use it or lose it? with respect to the budgeted amount for your unit. If an officer, if a commander is unable to spend the money that's been allocated to them for that fiscal year, if they don't do that, will they get less money the following year? Is that true or is that false? That's true and false. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> it's a typical Air Force military answer. It depends. It's a little more complicated than that. So like I told you with ops group where they spent all their money, but it wasn't based on a spend plan. It was at the end to purchase a bunch of equipment, Yeah. right? And because of that, I pulled money from them. So they spent it. It was not planned spending that was needed right. for them, Okay. right? So if people have a spend plan and they don't spend that money, I'm going to talk to their RA, hey, why didn't you spend this money? Oh, we are just not traveling like we used to. Okay, you do lose it, right? You didn't spend it. It is a trigger point where you should be evaluating, hey, they didn't spend it. Do they really need it? Yeah. And if it's because of someone in the position who wasn't doing their job and they didn't spend the money because that person didn't do their job of getting the equipment orders in, you know, supply or making those purchases or a commander who wasn't sending people to training, then they won't lose it if they could justify why they still need that money and the commander. So at the base level, I would say that's it's less likely to happen if the budget officer and finance is doing their job. But I will say that it is a problem at higher levels. Okay. Because when the MAGCOM is looking down to their other units and they look at all the different wings and they say, this wing hasn't spent this much, they don't have as much of a capability at base level as we do to figure out why. Yeah. And so I see that happening on a bigger level, which I guess is a bigger problem because it's bigger yeah. dollar amounts. Yeah. So how do you prevent that? You know, there's a lot of different ideas out there. I don't have any solutions for that other than mandating a more robust spend plan. 
but the problem with that is just resources. It's really hard. It's pulling teeth to get people to submit spend plans that have real detail. Majority of the units that would send me spend plans were very boilerplate, as little detail as possible. Yeah, and that kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier about the resource advisor and you know, obviously squadron commanders. They're not finance officers. It's not their primary job mm-hmm. unless they're a full-time RA. And most people don't necessarily think about numbers and budgets all the time. That's not something that they're really interested in. They're interested in the execution of the mission. They want to go fly. They want to build the next building. Mm-hmm. They want to complete a project, you know, get the aircraft ready for the next sortie. That's where their focus is. And they're not necessarily tuned in to the money aspect and don't really see the importance of the spend plan, which again, goes back to what we were saying earlier about having those relationships with the finance officer, having a better understanding of why is a spend plan that important? Because it informs you, the budget officer, who's going to then go inform the wing commander, who's going to make that decision about how to allocate those different budgets, right? Mm -hmm. The funds to the units. Yep. That's when I've seen the most effective leaders are the ones who are the most versed in that. I've had, you know, my wing commander in California, he got a lot of buildings built. Yeah. <laughs> he got a $25 million building built for the PJs. He worked a lot of relationships in the Silicon Valley area. You know, Google ended up buying the land from Moffett Field, and he was able to work with them to get them to build buildings for us in order for us to give up some properties that were outside our containment area. Yeah. So they built us new buildings inside our containment area so they could take over that land. But he understood how it worked. And because of that, he was able to get a lot more resources for the wing. Yeah, it's like what you said earlier. If you understand money, if you understand people, that translates into power and the ability to accomplish something. Yeah, I mean, that's a great case in point just right there. Are there any other misconceptions that you feel need to be cleared up with respect to the finance career field and being an officer in finance? Yeah, I just think that being pigeonholed that you're just a finance officer kind of does some people in, you know, there's a lot you can do for the whole base. Like I volunteered for the CGO council when I first came in. Yeah. Like we did a combat triathlon. We had four lieutenants in finance uh, and we went against army, Marines, SWAT teams, and we beat them all except one SWAT team. We beat the Marines, we beat the Army. So, and those those are four finance officers. So, <laughs> I'm sure that was pretty humbling for the Marines to get beat by Air Force finance. We had a former academy football player on our team. And so, I just think, just like I said with the assignments on where I went, it's what you make of it. So, the misconception who don't want to be finance, who get put into finance, that, oh, great, I'm stuck in this career field. Number one, it's great career field. Number two, you're not stuck. If you make yourself valuable, there's other avenues, right? You learn the money, you understand the money, go move somewhere else. My next step somewhere is a squadron commander, maybe logistics, maybe security forces, who knows? But I'm doing everything I can now to prepare for that. And my knowledge that I gain from finance officer is going to be super valuable as a squadron commander. For sure, yeah. So that's what I look at is, you know, That's not how I see myself as a finance officer. I saw finance as a part of my career for me to learn, to get experience, and to further my career. Yeah. There's very few officers that will just stay at base level finance their whole career. Usually you're moving on to functionals and Pentagon or a different thing outside of finance. So just learning that base, just know people, you're not stuck in finance. And even if you were stuck in finance. It's a good career field to be a part of. I mean, look at the things that you've been able to do, the conversations that we're having, the people that you get to be involved with. How many other career fields on a base can you influence everything else that's happening on the base, right? It's pretty rare to have a position like that and to work hand in hand with the wing commander and their staff to carry out their vision for the rest of the base and the missions that are there. Yeah, I can't say anything bad about the career field. 
I mean, obviously, just like every career field, there's frustrations in the processes or systems. But the people I worked with, the job I did, I never dreaded going to work. Yeah. Ever. I mean, sometimes work was work and you just had to go. But more often than not, I enjoyed going for the people, the sense of purpose for the mission, not losing sight of what we're actually doing and just being part of the greatest Air Force in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a really good place to leave the discussion about being a finance officer. But I have two more questions for you to wrap this up. First question is, if somebody wants to learn more about being a finance officer, or maybe they want to pick your brain a little bit more about being in the National Guard, some of the three-letter acronyms that you've thrown out, like ART, A-R-T, or A-G-R, or something along those lines, if they want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? You're always welcome to send an email to I. A, M is in Michael, N is in November, A T E 78 at gmail.com. That's I am Nate 78. So my name and birth year. I'd be happy to answer any questions people have, and I could send my phone number if we need to talk. Yeah, that's great. We'll link that in the show notes so people can find your contact information there. Great. Nate, one final question for you, and then uh, we'll let you go. What does it mean to be an officer? Hmm. Wow. It's a great one to, to end with and put me on the spot. <laughs> what does it mean to be an officer? For me, it comes down to holding up the three Air Force core values, right? If you do those three things as an officer and you exemplify that of integrity first, service before self, excellence in all we do, you're not going to go wrong. And I think that's something that I've always tried to hold up as an officer, integrity for myself, for the people around me, to know that when I said something, I meant it, right? That's a lot of power. When you're saying something, that's what you mean and that you're going to hold by your word. When I say I'm going to call you back, when I say I'm going to answer your email, you know, I'm going to do it. And then service, you know, I get paid pretty good for my job, but I know that there's a bigger calling than this. It's not about money. My mission here at this wing it has a nuclear component to it, right? I could get a call and I have to run to that base and I know that that something is incoming, but I have to run there to help support our planes taking off, right? So that's the part of service as an officer I would do. And then excellence in all we do is continuous improvement. Some of the best officers I know, it's they're never just complacent. They're yeah. learning more. They're doing more education, through PME, through civilian universities, through learning their job better, through broadening assignments and experiences, always trying to improve. So those three things is what it means to be an officer to me. I agree. Absolutely. 100%. The core values are the foundation to everything that we do as officers. Thank you so much, Nate. Lieutenant Colonel Nathan King, really appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge and experience with us, helping to pull the curtain back on the finance career field, clearing up some of those misconceptions and giving us a glimpse into one of the lesser known, lesser appreciated career fields, but really so critical and important to everything that we do, whether it's operations or support acquisitions or anything like that, finance is there taking apart and making things move forward for the Air Force. Hey, thanks for this opportunity, Colin, and hopefully it cleared up some people's views of finance and hopefully it gives somebody you know, a desire to go into that career field because it really is an excellent career field. Absolutely. Thank you so much and look forward to conversations in the future and best of luck to you being an IG and the rest of your career. Appreciate it, Colin. Take care. Hey, Colin, awesome interview. I learned a ton. My first thing that really comes to mind is I knew that finance was everywhere, but finance is everywhere. They're involved yeah. in everything. <laughs> and I, again, I always kind of conceptually understood that there needs to be finance. But, you know, I thought Intel had a lot of cool places we can go. They've got us beat because they're everywhere. Yeah. And what do you mean by everywhere? You mean it's not just that they are at every base, every installation, every physical location where there are Air Force operations taking place. But on the base, they are everywhere. Everybody needs their money. So 
finance literally has its fingers and its influence everywhere. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's the combination of the two. People look at Intel and say, oh, you guys know all this cool stuff. Well, yeah, about things happening thousands of miles away, but I don't know what's going on on my own base half the time. Finance, they know. Yeah. They know where all the skeletons are buried. They know everything. <laughs> just really cool talking to Colonel King. I just really appreciated his perspective and how he viewed the role finance played. And I thought he did a good job of lying that out for us. Yeah. It was such a pleasure to talk to Colonel King. I count him as a great friend and a great mentor. And I hope people want to know more. And then I hope that they will take the opportunity to reach out to him to get more information about how finance works, explain those different colors of money, or go find your local finance officer. There you sit go. Sit down with them, talk with them, have them become your friend, as I have been encouraging everybody to do for so long now, because that is really how you're going to accomplish anything that you need to happen is with that relationship with the finance officer and get that picture of what else is competing for the money that you need. What are the priorities? Is that conversation taking place? If you want to be a successful Air Force officer, you have to understand how money works. Yeah. And the people side of it as well. You know, you guys talked about those things. Sure. It's people and money. And that kind of leads us to some things that we need to talk about and are coming up in future episodes. Because Colin, at the top, you mentioned how just knowledge bomb after knowledge bomb. Well, there were so many that we need to like regroup and have more episodes. Yeah. Because he brought up a couple things that we recognize we really need to bring to the audience. And the first is he mentioned a riff and how a riff shaped his career. Read what's a riff? A reduction in force. It's a management tool that the Air Force uses to force shape to manage how many people we have. And there's a lot of ins and outs of that. And it's coming. Force shaping is happening right now. Yeah, there are programs that are available right now. And ROTC cadets are being told there's not going to be a spot for you. OTS boards and classes are getting canceled like stuff is happening. We can see the writing on the wall. Colin on our social media, you and I have pointed this out. We've been here before, we've seen what this looks like, and we want to try and describe it for our audience because irrespective of how long you're in, it's going to shape your career. Yeah. And so we owe it to you guys to kind of describe what that landscape looks like because it's uncomfortable for everybody involved. Mm -hmm. And these are part of the rules of the game that we're in. And we've highlighted before how important it is to know as many of those rules as possible so that you can have a better chance of navigating and being successful in this game. Yeah, absolutely. We don't know exactly when we'll get to that episode, but hopefully sooner rather than later, right, Reed? Yeah. Because just as you're saying, it's coming and we need to help everybody to be ready for it. And along those same lines, we want to provide additional information about other opportunities for serving. For example, Colonel King, he has spent almost his entire career in the Air National Guard. Well, I've never been in the Guard. Reed, you've never been in the Guard. And he said that those who are on active duty have no clue how the National Guard works. You know, these terms like AGR and art and palace chase and yada, yada, yada. We need to flesh that out a little bit more so that people know what their options are with respect to this riff that we know is coming. Exactly. It's going to be a part of your career, whether you like it or not. And we owe it to you guys. So that's one thing that we know we've got to bring. Colin, what was the other thing we were hoping to bring our audience after this? Because this is an episode on finance and we know that money is so important, we need to do a little more deep dive into what are these different colors of money. We keep talking about it, but we need to get into more depth around what those different colors of money are, why we have them, how we as officers can use them to accomplish the Air Force mission. Yeah, agreed. Like I mentioned, Colin, when we were talking about this episode, I recognized some deficit in that area. I've been trying to do some training to get spun up for my new assignment. And I went and found some class material and did some reading. And the slideshow was over 100 slides. I mean, there's a lot. And I got to know this stuff if I'm going to be effective in helping my, my team accomplish their mission. So totally agree. So those are the two toolbox episodes we're hoping to bring you. But yeah, knowledge bomb after knowledge bomb. Colin, what was something else that you you know, really took away from this interview. 
Well, Reed, I actually just thought of one more toolbox that would be really good because Colonel King was a great example of being a mentor here. We should do a toolbox on mentorship, on how to be an effective mentor, how to be an effective mentee. That's something I think that comes across in this episode as well. He doesn't say it specifically that this is what good mentorship looks like, but hey, everybody, this is what good mentorship looks like. Yeah, totally agree. And these are some of those unwritten rules. These are, again, not things we taught in training. We say it, find a good mentor. And then we don't describe how to do that yeah, or what categories you should have mentors for. Colin, you and I have discussed this. I have multiple mentors for different roles I have. Mm -hmm. I have mentors I look to for my role as a father, for a person of faith. I have mentors that I look at as intelligence officers or senior leaders or, you know, any number of other things. And so, yeah, totally agree. Good mentoring going on. That was absolutely something I wrote down as well. It's just how much knowledge was just dripping off the walls during that conversation. You know, it was really good and I enjoyed it quite a bit. Colin, something I wanted to bring out is the importance of relationships. He highlights how he was able to get some jobs at a certain time, at a certain place because of relationships he established as a young lieutenant. Yeah. It's so true. It is so true. And so I was just thinking about my next assignment. If anyone can't tell, I'm looking forward to it. I'm pretty excited to head out there to Ohio. <laughs> but part of the reason is because I get to be with people that I met in previous assignments. So let me just line this out. I'm going to be assigned to the same organization and work in the same location as people that I met in my first, second, third, fifth, sixth, and now seventh assignments. <laughs> it's amazing. I met these families, these individuals over the course of my short 10 years and stay in touch with them. And here we are, all of us, all of our families, all of our, you know, new kids, wives that, you know, I've not met yet, everything. And we're all going to be in the same place. And that's exciting. <laughs> that's exciting. I have to ask, though, I think I know the answer, but I want to hear it from you. How much of that do you think is just serendipity? How much of that is just because of chance? Or is that the norm for you to run into the same people over and over and over again over the course of your career? I think it's not as much chance as you think it is. I think the Air Force is smaller than you think it is. Yeah. How many times have you been at an exercise or TDY or deployed and run into somebody that you hadn't seen in six or seven years? You're like, oh, wow. Every time. Exactly. Every time. And everyone, what do we say? Wow, it's a small Air Force. Yep. Uh -huh. Chuckle, chuckle. <laughs> right. Okay. So the so what of this? Be kind. <laughs> Don't be a jerk. What kind of person do you want to be? Because you are going to run into these people again. And is it going to be a, oh, gosh, I have to work in the same place as so-and-so? And you, you know, actively avoid them in the halls of the building because they're there? Because those people exist. Yeah, they do. Those relationships are out there. And that cannot be avoided. And Reed, it's not just be kind. It's that you need to have a connection, a relationship with those people, right? Exactly. Yes. And this gets back to what we've said more recently, but really over the whole time that we've been doing this podcast is that if you want to be an effective officer, you have to connect with people. And then on top of that, you want to show that you are competent to the people that you work with so that they can rely on you to accomplish the mission and not be stagnant in your competence either. Continue to grow. When you run into those people later on in your career, you should not be doing the exact same thing as you were seven years ago when you saw them last. Exactly. You should have some new knowledge. You should have some new experience that you can bring to the conversation. Yes. And you should be able to use your connection with that person to a mutual benefit. Yeah. Because that's what's going to happen. I know. So a bunch of these folks are going to be directors of operations of different squadrons yeah. in and around the location where we're going to be. And already I can see overlap. Already I can see opportunities for both of our squadrons to support the other. And that pre existing connection and relationship that we have and our knowledge of what we've done over the years is only going to help 
Yeah. As we pick up the phone some random Thursday to, you know, put out this fire, we're going to be able to make that happen. The Air Force is smaller than you think it is. And I want everyone right now, wherever they are in their career, to think about what kind of person do they want to be? What is the reputation you want to have? Yeah. Do you want to be known as someone who will burn everything down to get it done, but no one wants to be around? That's a choice. You can do that if you like. I'm not going to choose what it should be for you. I know what it's going to be for me, at least as much as I can control. And that's something I just want everybody to think about. My question here is how do we then keep it from turning into a good old boys club? Because you are going to eventually be assigned with people from your first, second, third, fifth, sixth, and seventh assignments. When everybody's wearing oak leaves or birds and has responsibility for large numbers of people, big pots of money, and very important operations, and there's that very small cohort of people who have been working with each other and now have that huge amount of responsibility, how do we keep that from turning into a good old boys club? So why don't you define what in your view is a good old boys club? Because to some degree, I think you just defined the whole Air Force. I did, yeah. So we've talked about how who you know and what you know matters. We've talked about how we decide who gets to be in the club, how we set the rules. So what are the aspects of this good old boys club that you are concerned about? Because I think we are doing things to actively push back on some of that. Why don't you define the things you're concerned about? Yeah, so I think the biggest concern is that it does not allow for people who don't look or think like you to be an effective part of the organization. And that could absolutely be focused on like the diversity and inclusion side of things, but it doesn't have to be just that. It could be that there's just somebody that rubs you the wrong way and you're not willing to listen to them, right? So I think that's really where I'm at with this is how do we make sure that not just always work with the same people because we know and feel comfortable with them, but are still open and willing to work with those who we haven't met yet, despite how small the Air Force might be. Yeah, it's a good point. The thing that I take confidence away in this regard is that I hear people actively talking about how do we make sure that doesn't happen and then taking steps to try and ensure that it doesn't. Is it just talk? I hope not. I see signs that it isn't, but can we avoid the fact that it just might be? I don't think we can. So I think that is a good problem I don't have an answer for. Well, I think that Colonel King does have the answer for us, that you be willing to get out from behind your desk, get out from behind the O Club or wherever it is that you're meeting with the same group of people on the regular basis, and go talk to others. Have that still be part of your normal day-to-day operations when you are at that level where you are a squadron commander, a DEO, or even higher than that. Go find that O1, that E5, or whoever, and have a conversation with them. Ask those questions like he described in the interview of, tell me about your family, what are your hobbies, what are these other things that you are interested in, instead of trying to lead or manage through email, because just as he said, That's just about business. And sometimes in order to truly connect and have that relationship with people, you need to open up the aperture a little bit and have a conversation around things that are peripheral to the daily operations that will then help you to find ways to solve problems and be more effective in ways that you hadn't originally anticipated. Yeah, no, that's really awesome advice. So Colin, what was the last thing that you wanted to bring up? I know we talked about it when we were offline, but it's so good. I'm going to let you go a little bit on this one. Yeah. So there's actually two things that I want to bring up here. The first one is that how cool that finance is, like we were saying, everywhere. But one of the most important places that they are is in the room where it happens, meaning they're there for the conversation with the wing commander as these decisions are being made with respect to the allocation of funds and making sure that that's how they're going to accomplish the mission for the Air Force. Yeah, from the very beginning. Yeah. As an O-1, 
And it's not just the room where it happens. It's all of the rooms where it's always happening. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's just everywhere. Unreal. And what an amazing opportunity for a young lieutenant from the outset be part of those conversations and get those high-level strategic discussions and vision from the very beginning and through the whole course of the career. I mean, we've talked how we feel like we're not necessarily being prepared for that type of FGO level leadership, but the finance officer absolutely is because they're rubbing shoulders with squadron commanders, wing commanders on the daily basis because just by nature of their responsibility. Yeah, that makes me remember back to our time with PA, also another officer who is immediately attached to and dealing with wing commanders on a daily basis. They bring a different perspective. Yeah, and also another career field shrouded in misconception and not a whole lot of people are super excited about going into, which now that I've learned more about PA and now that I've learned more about finance, I think that that mentality is completely wrong. Yeah, totally agree. And then the follow on to this is really where I want to spend the rest of our time really flesh this out for people is Colonel King talks about how important it is for you to know money and people. And if you can combine those two things, therein is power. Yes, for real. <laughs> and exactly that, Reed, I want to talk about why that is the case. I mean, yeah, even just without going into any depth about it, if you know money, and if you know how the people processes work, then you are the person who has all the knowledge necessary to steer how the Air Force is going to play out, how the operation is going to take place, what things are going to happen within the Air Force. But I want to spend just a few minutes here actually talking about why that is the case. So, Reed, I'm going to turn it over to you here. Since you're going into a DO role where these kinds of things are happening, where money and people are the focus of the day to day, share a little bit of the thoughts that you're having as you're preparing for this role. Yeah. So, recently I went TDY out to the unit that I'm going to be going to this summer to have a bit of a get to know people in the organization, see what the organization's doing, meet other faces and important personalities that I'll be working with daily. And I would say 85% of my time and the things we discussed were billets and bodies. Who is where doing what? What skills do they have? What people do we need to hire? Manpower challenges, you know, all of the things that go along with, you know, those bodies and billets. And then money. Where is the money coming from? How fast is it coming? What kinds of money do we have? I had no idea there were that many kinds of money. <laughs> I thought I had an idea, but there are a lot. And again, it's one of those things that you know intellectually. You know that in order to do anything, you have to have stuff yeah. to do it. And what is stuff? It's people and it's money. Yes, there's equipment in there. But where does the equipment come from? Well, you've got to buy it with money. Yeah. And even if you do have the stuff, if you don't have the money to run the stuff, then you might as well not have the stuff. Yeah. Right? An F-35 without gas and bombs is just a really pretty looking gray piece of metal. Yeah. You know, like you can't do anything unless you have money to fly it. So, but until it becomes your daily responsibility to make those things happen and to, Colin, as we've talked about with leaders, have a vision and then guide your team, those people that you lead to that place, if you don't have the right people and you don't have the right money, nothing's going to happen. And so how do you establish that vision? How do you bring something into reality? Money and people. Yeah. Which, as you said, that's the stuff of Air Force operations. Or to put it another way, those are the resources that we are responsible for as Air Force officers. And not to belabor this again, but one of our least popular episodes is the one where we did a really deep dive into the responsibility of managing resources, Yeah, which is a stated responsibility for commanders in the Air Force. And all commission officers carry the potential for command. That is something that we need to know. And let's be honest, Reed, we are not 
doing a good job of developing officers to manage resources. Yeah. We don't know enough about how the manpower process works. We don't know enough about all the different colors of money, the rules and regulations of how it can be spent. We are not preparing ourselves well enough. Yeah. We're certainly not deliberately developing it. I learned a lot of manpower stuff when I was a group exec because my commander was dealing with it and I was in the room and I learned all these things and I don't know what that acronym means and I go look it up and it's just kind of by absorption, you know, by, it just, it's in the air and so you breathe it in yeah. and all of a sudden you kind of just pick it up here and here and there. That's not adequate at all. Right. And it's certainly insufficient when all of a sudden it's your responsibility. So yeah, Friday, I spent some time asking around with my peers, hey, how did you learn about this? How did you learn about that? And finding some course material and downloading that and creating permalinks so that I can access it later because I recognize I absolutely have some growth to do there. And I don't have very much time. Colin, I'm looking at the calendar. I've, <laughs> I got to get this figured out. <laughs> yeah, I'm really glad I was able to go now to give me that vision of what I need to know when I get there. So yeah, yeah. but you're right. We're not deliberately developing those skills enough. And yet it's not what attracts people. Yeah, because it's not sexy. It's not sexy at all. I mean, who are we kidding? If you want to say, let's talk about, you know, basic fighter maneuvers or let's talk about appropriations. Yeah, <laughs> that gets me up in the morning. And I know it does for some folks, but come on, we're competing with really cool things that we are also responsible for. Yeah. Right. These are also responsibilities to become competent. And so I think at some degree, the competence wins out. And we've mentioned this, you know, look at our OPRs now, think about what we talk about and train. So it's definitely something that's become more apparent the longer we're in. This idea of managing resources becomes more and more critical. Yeah, absolutely. And the 65 Foxtrot, the finance officer, is going to be central to your understanding all of that. Again, this is why I say this person needs to be your best friend. Yeah. And if not your best friend, at least somebody that you are able to talk to on a regular basis. Yeah. Maybe there's some idiosyncrasies there, personality conflicts where you just two of you can't be attached to the hip, but that doesn't mean that you can't be kind. That doesn't mean you can't reach out to them and try to get this information so that you can be more effective in your own role, whether you're a finance officer or not. Yeah. Awesome that Lieutenant Colonel King joined you for that interview. Really awesome that we could bring it to you, our audience. Uh, we'd love to hear from you if you have any feedback or questions. Colonel King graciously gave some contact info so that you could reach out to him. Highly recommend you do that so that you can solve some of your own knowledge gaps. Anything else, Colin, before we wrap up today? Just the invitation that if you got anything out of this episode, which you should have, if you didn't go listen to it again. I know I did. <laughs> right. If you got anything out of this, please share it with others because this type of information is so critical to the development of the Air Force officer so that we can all be as effective as possible, regardless of where we find ourselves, regardless of our career field. It's this type of information that we all need to know. So please share it with others, invite your network to tune into this episode, get some information about how they can work with finance or become more informed about the way that money and manpower works. Awesome. That'll do it for this week. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of Commission Ed.